This is our third lesson in a series here of three lessons. And we've been studying on the subject of abortion. In the first lesson on abortion, I went through the fact that the fetus is a living human being, separate from the mother. And so we concluded from using strictly science, not the Bible at all. It's a rare occasion I don't use the Bible in my sermons, but I didn't in that sermon two weeks ago. The second sermon last week, we went through the subject of what does the Bible say about an unborn child? And of course, the first lesson was designed for those who are unbelievers in God. The second was designed for those who believe in God. And this lesson this morning, it will begin in just a moment. Now, he's going to edit out what I just said, so it won't be on the internet. This will be on the internet. These lessons will be put on the internet. We'll have a link for it very shortly. And we'll give you the link to all these lessons. You can listen to them again. Now, abortion, lesson three. This is our third lesson in this series. We want to look at the consequences here of offering these children upon the altar of convenience. It is inconvenient for the mother to have give birth to that baby. So she sacrifices it. Our society has condoned this. Righteousness, as we see here, exalts a person or even a whole nation. But sin is a reproach. In fact, if we see this, we'll see that passage that we just read in our, in our beginning. God sent Israel into captivity for the sin of causing her children to be sacrificed to the idol Moloch, also called Milcah. So this Moloch God, they would sacrifice their babies and burn them alive to it. It's an awful situation. Even contemplate such an evil thing. But it was the height of evil and God punished them for it. The shedding of innocent blood has been one of the most serious sins that a person can commit throughout the Bible. Shedding innocent blood. Now he's not talking about putting to death a person who has been guilty of murder. That's been condoned by God. That is capital punishment. But shedding innocent blood, there's a serious price to pay if a nation tolerates that. If a nation tolerates that, God will punish them. There are sins at which a nation can be guilty as well as people. We've seen that a congregation of the Lord's church can be guilty of a collective sin, individuals can be guilty of sin, and a whole community can be guilty of sin, and even a whole nation can be guilty of sin. In Proverbs 14.34, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. The word ETH, the ETH ending indicates continuous. It exalts and keeps on exalting a nation. So righteousness is critical in our society that would be righteous as a nation. If our, is our government designed by God God intends that all civil governments should be a terror to evil works and a rewarder of good. That's the intention of God. Nations that do that are blessed by God. For rulers are not a terror to the good work. They were not set in place to be a terror to good, but to the evil. And would us have no fear of the power? He's telling Christians not to rebel against their government, a constituted government. Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise from the same. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. In other words, the civil government was instituted by God and allowed to exist by God for the purpose of rewarding good and being a terror or make people afraid of doing evil. Some people are so wicked, they have to fear. They have to fear doing evil. And fear is their motive. Now, Good people are motivated way beyond what the civil law says. They do what's right because that's what God says. So they obey a higher law. But they will obey the civil rulers. There is one exception. In Acts 5.29, they, we must obey God rather than men. And so if the civil government tells us to do something that's wicked, we can't do it. 
Okay? So we draw a line there. But God appointed even the boundaries of nations and the times for that nation to exist. Boundaries are fixed by the amount of service the, the nation rendered to God. In Acts 17, 26, and he made, he, God, made of one, all, every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. We're all descended from Adam and Eve. We're all of one, having determined their appointed season and the bounds of their habitation. So there's two things here that we see. The appointed seasons, the times for the existence of that nation have been appointed by God. And we will we'll see as we study this, it's determined by that nation's righteousness and the bounds of their habitation, the boundaries that they have, the boundaries that they have and where they exist. These are appointed by God, are determined by God. They, he is determined. Now we'll see the principles upon which he determined these things. Nations are punished by God for their collective sins. In Leviticus 18, 21 through 25, and thou shalt not give any of thy seed to make them pass through the fire to Moloch. This is the God Moloch that they burned their babies alive, little babies alive, in order to sacrifice, as a sacrifice to that idol God. Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord, I am Jehovah. So they were not to offer human sacrifice. This was an abomination to God. He hated it. And he says, I am Jehovah, that's a warning to the Jews because the word Jehovah is one who exists because he exists. Self-existent one, it's a burning bush. That word is identified. God has created all things. Something has always existed. And God said, I am. And that word I am carries, that's a verb form of the word for Jehovah. I exist because I exist. I am self-existent. I have always existed. It's a very simple principle of science. You don't get something from nothing. It's a simple principle of mathematics. Zero plus zero is zero. You don't get 20 if you add zero to zero. And so something has always existed. God says, that's me. I am. I exist because I exist. Everything else was created by me. So he says, I am Jehovah. That scared the Jews. Rightfully so. That expression. They were even afraid to say those words lest they say them wrongly. I think they got superstitious over it. But they were afraid to do that. Because that word is a frightening thing. It's all caps Lord in the King James Version. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. Another sin that they listed here was homosexuality, which we'll not look at at this time. In, in further detail, we're, we're zeroing in on the subject of abortion. In verse 23, I shall not lie with a beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto. It is confusion. Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things. So now here we see our nation not only with the shedding of innocent blood, but these other sins, which we'll, we'll go away from just now. But these things are things that God finds an abomination. Defile not yourselves in any of these things. He warns them before they come into the land not to do these things because this is what caused the nations of the land of Canaan to have to be driven out. These wickedness, these sins that they had committed. So he says, defile not yourselves in any of these things for in all of these the nations are defiled which I cast out from before you. I cast them out because they did these things. And the land is defiled. Therefore, I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it. And the land vomiteth out her inhabitants. It's telling us that these are the reasons, these sins of which America is guilty are the very sins for which we find the Lord vomiting, the land vomiting them out. And that's, that's a very vivid expression when we see here. God was very displeased with the Canaanites. Because of their sins. God sent Israel. Now he warned Israel in Leviticus. Before they went into the land. Don't do these things. I'm causing them to lose the land. Because they've done this. Don't you do these things. So God sent Israel into captivity. For the sin. 
the very sins of which he warned them right here. In Jeremiah 31, 32, verse, uh, verse 35 through 36, we see them sacrificing their children to Moloch, just as he told them not to do. The Western world has sacrificed their children to the God of convenience. It is inconvenient to have the baby. And so we've had abortions. Legalized by our government. Let's go to Jeremiah 32, 35. This is toward the end of the nation of Judah. After the death of Solomon, the nation split into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom called Israel, the southern kingdom called Judah. Israel went into captivity for their sins. In about 722 B.C., the Assyrians carried them into captivity. Then about 120, 130 years later, they received the Babylonians carrying the nation of Judah into captivity. Jeremiah is preaching about that time. He is, he is alive when the captivity begins. And he says, and they built the high places of Baal, that is the children of Israel, Judah. This is the nation of Judah at this time, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to pass, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire into Moloch. Right here. They built high places to worship the god Moloch. And they made their children pass through the fire to Moloch, which I commanded them not. Neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. It's an abomination. God says, I don't like that. I hate it. It's an abomination to me. In verse 36, And now therefore thus saith Jehovah the God of Israel, concerning this city, concerning Jerusalem, Wherever you say it is given in the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. What happened whenever they were surrounded by the Babylonian army? Because they couldn't get rid of their waste and stuff, began to have all kinds of pestilence, disease came. Then the sword came. Famine came because they were closed in. They couldn't get food. They had water, but they didn't have food. Notice he didn't say water. They had Figured out how to way to get water, but they didn't have food, and so they began to die. But he sang by the thousands. That's exactly what we see when we read in Jeremiah. We can see it happening in the Chronicles and Kings. We see it happen. The record is there, clear, because of their sin. God had protected the little nation of Israel until she turned from God, and when she turned from God, He quit protecting that nation. They sacrificed their children by making them pass through the fire to Moloch, burning them alive to this idol God. They promised, God promised that they would go into captivity for this sin if they committed it. And so they committed it, and so they went into captivity. The Western world, including the United States, are fundamentally no different than Israel of old. We sacrifice our babies by the millions on the altar of convenience. We're no different. God is the same. I fear for America because of this. We, the church, need to speak out against it, be against it. But our nation may be in trouble, may have gone too far. Romans 15, 4, for whatsoever things, he's talking about the things were written aforetime, that's the Old Testament. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. That, here's the purpose. In order that will be a better translation. Through patience and through comfort of the scriptures we might have hope. Go to the scriptures. Even those who were carried away into captivity lived. But they lived in a different situation. And we as God's people need to always cling to God. And do what God says. And be busy trying to convert the lost. The shedding of innocent blood has serious consequences. In Deuteronomy 19.8, and, Je and if Jehovah thy God enlarge thy border, he's going to do that. He's going to enlarge your border until you get all the land that you were promised. And they did get all the land they were promised. In the days of David and Solomon, they ruled all the land God had promised to give to Abraham. So he says, if he enlarge thy border, and he has, as he has sworn unto thy fathers, as he told Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he would do. And he has sworn, as he has sworn unto them, and give thee all the land which he promised to give unto thy fathers, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Now watch. If thou shalt keep all his commandment to do it, which I command thee this day to love Jehovah thy God and walk ever in his ways, 
Then shalt thou add three cities more for thee besides these three. So he gave more cities to them. That is, this would be the cities of refuge. That innocent blood be not shed in the midst of thy land, which Jehovah thy God giveth thee for an inheritance, and so blood be upon thee. So he gave all of these cities. There were six cities of refuge. These were cities where if you accidentally killed someone, you could go and get judgment and be saved from being put to death. But it was innocent blood that was, that was shed. If you accidentally killed someone, accident, not on purpose, not murder. Manasseh, king of Judah, one of the latter kings, he led Judah into this sin of offering babies as sacrifices. And Jehovah spake by his servants the prophets, saying, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, hath done these abominations, and hath done wickedly, above all that the Amorites did. The Amorites were the people that lived in the land of Canaan when the children of Israel came into the land. So they've gone, they've gone above what those people did that, that were before them, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols, that is, Manasseh did. Therefore thus saith Jehovah, the God of Israel, Behold, I bring such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, and whosoever heareth it, both his ears shall tingle. God says, I'm going to punish them. I'm going to punish Israel. Now, if Israel was punished for that sin, America can't expect anything less. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab. And I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth the dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. I'm going to wipe them clean. I'm going to wipe them out. They're not going to exist in the land anymore. And they were taken out of the land. Judah was a desolation for 70 years. Nobody lived there. That's exactly what we see happening. Jeremiah prophesied of 70 years of captivity. And the false prophet said, oh, it won't happen. And Jeremiah was right. He's a true prophet. In verse 14, And I will cast off the remnant of mine inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies. They were already a remnant. Their many had already been killed. I'll deliver them into the hand of their enemies. Now, did God bring the enemies in? No. God just says, I won't protect you anymore. And these nations will be able to overrun you. In the early days, such men as Gideon, Took 300 men and wiped out a foreign army because God was with him. When God was with them, they couldn't be beaten. Now, that's what we see here. And because they have done that which is evil on my side and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came out of the land of Egypt, even unto this day. See, they're going to become a prey and a spoil to these other nations. A spoil means they're going to take all that you have. All your houses, your goods, and your animals, and your, your land even. They took it. Moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to the other, to another. Besides his sin, therewith he made Judah to sin and do that which is evil in the sight of Jehovah. Here's all the evil things that Manasseh did. And even this man, Manasseh, when you read about him, at the end of his life he repented and tried to undo it, but he couldn't undo it. Sometimes things have gone too far. When they go too far, it's too late. I don't know about America, but I know we as God's people need to be busy trying to convert people, trying to get people to see what's right and what is wrong. That's our job. That's all we can do as God's people. Just be busy teaching the lost. And that will help. Judah was finally punished for their sins in 2 Kings 24.1. In the day of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up. So in his days, he came up. And Jehoiakim became his servant three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. In other words, this man Jehoiakim was very interesting. He made an oath by the name of Jehovah. He swore by God that he would obey the king of Babylon. And then after three years, he rebelled. Well, when you gave your word and swore by God, you keep your word. God says, you, if you swear by me, you better keep your word. That's Old Testament. We don't have time to go through it. 
but you better keep your word. And he didn't. And what happened was, Jehovah sent against him bands of the Chaldeans. He sent them, yes, because he let them come. They were angry because they'd rebelled. Bands of the Chaldeans and bands of the Moabites and bands of the children of Ammon. These are the nations in the east of them who hated them and sent them against Judah to destroy it. According to the word of Jehovah, which he spake by his servants, the prophets. All the prophets had prophesied of this. Warn them if they get under this sin and do this, it's an evil thing. If this king had just obeyed and kept his word, it wouldn't have happened. But you see, they just had rejected God altogether. Jehovah's nothing. That was their idea. And so they just are not doing what God said. Didn't trust God. Didn't honor God. Didn't re uh, hold God up, esteem him above all else. Verse 3 says, Surely at the commandment of Jehovah came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh. We've already seen Manasseh, what he did. According to all that he did, and also for the innocent blood that he shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and Jehovah will not pardon. Somebody has to pay for it. This innocent blood. But look further. Let's go to the book of Psalms and see. Yea, they sacrifice their sons and their daughters unto demons. The word demon is used for an idol god. And shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and their daughters. And they sacrifice unto the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. Thus they have, for they defiled with their works and played the harlot in their doings. Playing the harlot is they went after false gods. God was styled as their husband. And so they went after false gods. That's harlotry. Spiritual adultery is what it's called. Other passages. In verse 40, therefore was the wrath of Jehovah Kendall against his people. And he abhorred his inheritance. He hated them. He became angry with them. He hated their sin is what he hated. Not the people. He hated sin. And he gave them into the hand of the nations that they and they that hated them ruled over them. They began to be ruled by those that hated them and they're not going to be treated well when that happens. The shedding of innocent blood was a major factor in Judah's punishment. Major. Major factor. Gentile nations were also punished for shedding innocent blood as well. Let's look at uh, Joel 3.19 and see Egypt. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom shall be desolate, a desolate wilderness. For the violence done to the children of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. In other words, if you think this is only for Israel, think again. These Gentile nations suffered too, for the very same sins. The United States can't expect anything less. The Western world can. Can't expect less. Our nation has shed the blood of millions of our own children. Can we expect a righteous God to treat us any differently than he treated Israel and the Gentile nations around Israel? I don't think so. I know that we'll be punished for this national sin. I don't know how God will punish us. But we will be punished. I have no doubt. The United States needs to repent. We need to repent. It is a crime to destroy an eagle's egg because it's been fertilized. Did you know that? Why isn't it a crime to destroy a fertilized human egg? Don't you wonder about stuff like that? Are animals more valuable than humans? As a professor at Rose State College, I asked an atheistic, an atheist who was a biology professor, which would be the most wrong thing to do of these two things? Kill a baby eagle, bald eagle, or kill a baby human? And he said killing the baby eagle because they were near extinction or there's a danger of their becoming extinct. That is where we get this foolish thinking. I'm not for killing off animals, making them extinct. Don't, don't take that that way. But a human is different than an animal. We are not merely animals as our school systems teach our children. 
Now, individual teachers teach the truth, may. Maybe have a Christian who's teaching and will not teach this. But we are taught in our school systems, our children are, that we are animals. That's what we're taught. By this reasoning, we show that we think that human babies are less valuable than an animal. That's what we say. It is a crime to murder a murder to kill a pregnant woman. And it should be. In fact, they will often try the killer for two murders. The murder of the woman and the murder of the unborn child. That is a fact. You can see this. When a pregnant woman is killed, you watch it in the news. Watch it in the newspaper. You'll see it. By this reasoning, they just show just how irrational that we have become. Because think about this. If you have a pregnant woman who's killed, if her baby is not human, not a living separate human being, how can you try the man who killed that pregnant woman for two murders? See how foolish our courts are? I think they're dumb as a post, as we used to say when I grew up. They're dumb as a post. If you try that man who killed that pregnant woman for two murders, you're saying that unborn child is a human that he murdered. And yet our courts will let them do it, but will let a man abort that baby. And he doesn't commit any crime at all. Our courts don't have a lick of sense. Not one bit of sense. I just say that. I am just, I'm just sick of them to see that kind of foolishness in our courts. I'm sorry. I just can't help myself with that. This is all the fruits of atheism and the irrational reason that allowed people to become atheists. For the chief musician of Psalm of David, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They're, they're fools. Now, lest you say I've committed a violation of Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount, it's a different word for fool. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. None that's a fool. None that says there's no God. Or they may do some things that are good, but their overall life is not good. So atheism is, is our problem. A disbelief in God. A misunderstanding or a gross twisting of God's word to make it justify these sins. But the word of God is plain. We gave our very first lesson on this. And we showed from science that even the atheists should not take this. But of course they don't believe that we're anything but animals and you can kill an animal. So it's okay. Population control, see. God hates the hands that shed innocent blood. In the book of Proverbs, we have a, a method here of uh, emphasizing a point. It's called parallelism. And it's, uh, it's like stepping up, a stair steps. There are six things which the Lord or Jehovah hateth. Yea, seven, which are an abomination unto him. That's a, that's a way of emphasizing it. There are seven. So six. Oh, seven. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue. Third one is shed, hands that shed innocent blood. God hates that. Calls the lesson of that. God warned Israel of the sin of shedding innocent blood. They're warned. He warned them of consequences. God decreed that the set of sin of shedding innocent blood would be severely punished. And a whole nation could be suffered for it, allowing it to occur. Israel shed innocent blood and was punished. Gentile nations were also punished. The United States and the Western world in general, Europe, will be punished sometime or some way. They have to be because God is righteous. I fear for our nation, but we as God's people, if we'll be faithful, we'll have a home in heaven. We need not worry. But if we serve God, we don't have to worry. But we need to be busy. Let's, let's take as many people to heaven with us as we can. Let's let people see these things, the evil of this. This concludes my lesson on the study of abortion.